Good evening. I'm Tom Baird, Vice President for Development at the University of Michigan, and I'm so pleased that you could join us this evening. Welcome to our Victors, Heroes, Wolverine series. I especially want to thank those of you who have students at Michigan this fall. We are so honored to have your students attending Michigan during this time. As you know, there's been a lot happening on campus this fall, and you may have heard of a variety of perspectives in the news and on social media. So today we're looking forward to sharing some accurate information with you directly from our leaders who are actively involved on a daily basis. So I'm very pleased to have with us tonight two terrific U of M leaders to give you updates and insight into where we are and how we're moving forward. Susan Collins became the U of M Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs earlier this year. Dr. Collins is a renowned expert in the international macro economy, serving as Dean of U of M's Ford School of Public Policy for many years. As Provost, she's responsible for the university's academic and budgetary affairs. We'll also hear this evening from De uh, Dean Du Bois Bowman, who has served as, who is currently the Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Michigan. Dr. Bowman is an expert in the statistical analysis of brain imaging data. He has also served on one of the key public health advisory roles for the state of Michigan and the university through our COVID-19 planning. So tonight we're gonna to hear a few remarks from Provost Collins and Dean Bowman, and then we'll come back together for a panel conversation. Provost Collins, would you like to get us started? Absolutely, I'm delighted to. Thank you very much, Tom. And um, it's wonderful to be here today with all of you. Um, it's, it's great to see just how many people are on. And um, I, I wanna uh, thank you for your interest in hearing a bit more about all of the things that are happening at the University of Michigan. And we're really grateful for all of the ways that you continue to support our efforts. Um, so just like society as a whole, the university has been grappling with a, a wide range of challenges from the pandemic to the economic issues, the issues related to systemic racism, which of course are a longstanding, but have been a focus uh, in recent months and the civil protests, the climate change issues. I mean, quite a long list. And in response, um, we of course remain very focused on our mission, our education, our research, and our service engagement mission. Um, they're really crucial to addressing those challenges. And so um, I wanna say a bit about some of uh, how that all comes together for a very unusual fall. Um, I'm gonna give a, an overview. There's like, as I said, a lot going on. And so I look forward to having more of a conversation during the question and answer part of our time together. So as you all know, the university has a number of experts and their work focuses on many aspects of these crises. Their knowledge and um, background has really shaped our plans in the past and it continues to guide us as the circumstances change and we learn more about the challenges in particular the pandemic but other challenges as well and the ways that they interact our plan to offer a public health informed academic year was developed in close consultation with faculty from medicine and public health not surprisingly and you'll hear more from my colleague du bois bowman uh, shortly um, we also drew on the expertise of faculty from across a wide range of, of areas. So behavioral science, pedagogy, engineering, educational technology. In the educational sphere, um, as we kind of thought about how to move forward in such an unusual time, we um, identified some of the key guiding principles that uh, really have been um, core to how we think about things. First, as we learned really clearly during the winter term, some types of instruction really is best done in person. There are some types of lab classes, performance and studio classes where the, the type of engagement and what you can do with um, some in-person engagement really does enhance the activity in important ways. We also really believe that those informal interactions with faculty help to deepen students' learning. And so there's certainly things that you can do really creatively uh, with remote technology, and we're leveraging those in a variety of ways I'm happy to talk about. But for some kinds of things, those informal engagements really matter. It's also important to provide students with opportunities to interact with people from different backgrounds. And of course, that's happening somewhat differently in the current context, but it is happening and that's really, that's really important. And the university also has a responsibility to invest in this generation of students as fully as we have in other generations. The 
um, challenges the pandemic we're grappling with is not something that's just going to be with us for a couple of months. It's going to be something that we're going to have to deal with um, over somewhat longer term. So those were some of the guiding principles. We also knew that many students would return to Ann Arbor, even if we didn't have students in our residence halls, for example. And so we recognized that in addition to our academic planning, we would also need to plan ways to decrease the density on campus to protect health and safety in settings as varied as bus transportation. How, how would we think about that? To our dining halls, to how we use our libraries in new ways. We focused on developing a plan that would provide the best possible education experience in the context that we had while addressing the health and safety concerns of students, faculty, staff, and the larger community. So the hybrid approach that we chose um, has about 77% of our undergraduate course credits available in remote formats, and then a mix of in-person and hybrid instruction for the remaining um, part of, of, our, uh, of our instruction. And as I mentioned, in large part, those are the kinds of instructional activities that just don't work as well remotely, including our labs, our studio, and some of our clinical performance kinds of, of classes as well. I really think that that's the best approach. It offers flexibility. It addresses concerns related to equity and access. It allows us to adjust as circumstances change among um, faculty and among students. It, it, it enabled us to give students a choice and recognize that some students were not able to come back to campus, perhaps for visa reasons. So over the summer, we provided all kinds of central support to help faculty have the opportunity to really develop and restructure their classes because they were going to be teaching in a number of new modes that are really different from the way that faculty traditionally taught their classes. They also met, uh, took advantage of our Center for Academic Innovation. They met in a number of various kinds of um, practice groups and strengthened their skills and, and tried things out in a variety of ways. This is ongoing as we continue to learn how to do things better. Um, and I've been so excited by um, the extent to which people have really stepped up and uh, just jumped in and been creative and worked hard to figure out the best ways forward. Um, Research is also an integral part, of course, of how the university contributes to society. And so, as you may know, most of the university's research activity was actually on hiatus from mid-March through mid-May. And then with the exception of the work that had direct bearing on understanding the coronavirus and providing treatment to patients. Um, and so we began a really careful reopening of research operations in mid-May. At first, there were only a few units that were part of that, with that restart, each with a very limited number of researchers. And then we basically was kind of learning by doing. Uh, and so we figured out where we needed to focus attention to address safety and health concerns and have ramped up and expanded things over time. And that also helped inform our instructional reopen as well. We're now at about 60% capacity in research with in-person and human subject research, the last to come back, but it has come back. And, and that's something that we're, we think is going very well. And one of the strengths of our undergraduate education programs is really the opportunity that students have to engage in research. Um, so many studies tell us that it's just a key part of student learning and it contributes to completing degrees in a variety of different ways. Initially, only seniors, undergraduate seniors, were allowed back in the lab, but we're really pleased that now we've been able to open the labs up to allow all of our undergraduates to be back and part of that exciting work. I want to end by saying just a bit about service. Um, it's a responsibility we take very seriously, you know, especially as my own background as dean of the Ford School, that public engagement and service is, is really important in a variety of different ways in my view. So as you might expect in the early days of the pandemic, service was really focused in many ways on the pressing medical concerns, particularly patient care. Um, currently, our faculty from public health and medicine are serving in advisory roles, as Tom already mentioned, to the state government and its responsibilities related to the pandemic. In addition, our Poverty Solutions Center has developed materials that help communities and individuals benefit from the very complicated set of federal, state, and nonprofit programs that can help them with food security issues, with income support, um, and a variety of other supports that have come up over recent, uh, recent months. So there's a huge amount going on across campus. Um, 
It is not a kind of typical semester in any ways, but we're so proud of the work that our faculty and our students are doing. Um, and it's been a pleasure to give you kind of an overview of some of the, the key things that are underway. So with that, it's now my pleasure to turn the virtual microphone over to my colleague, Du Bois Bowman, who is Dean of the School of Public Health. Du Bois. Thank you very much, Provost Collins, and good afternoon or good evening to, to everyone. It's my pleasure to be with you today, and I'd like to start by first just thanking you for your ongoing commitment to the University of Michigan. And as Tom mentioned in my introduction, I have the uh, distinct pleasure of serving as Dean of the University of Michigan School of Public Health, and also the, the privilege of serving as Dean at a school where I'm also an alumnus. I received my master's degree here uh, at the University of Michigan School of Public Health in, in biostatistics and professionally spent my career at Columbia University and Emory University prior to coming, uh, returning to, to Michigan. The, the University of Michigan School of Public Health has a, a long history of excellence and service that operates you know, at a state and, and, and global level and currently sits among the top five ranked schools of, of public health in the, in the nation. And uh, although I've, I've served as Dean uh, for two years, I, I, we need some kind of analog to dog years that 2020 uh, has somehow made it feel much longer. Um, and, you know, we still have some months remaining. So, I uh, certainly have enjoyed being back and look forward to the to the important work that is taking place at the school and, and really contributing to assist the university, the state and, and, and nationally. So, so um, back really in the early days, um, uh, I'd say early in the new year, many faculty began to to work in response to, to, to COVID. And at this time, you know, it was when COVID was still largely confined to, to Wuhan in China. And, and since that time, a number of efforts have uh, taken place throughout the, 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 uh, the school. Uh, next slide, please. And so the slide on the screen shows just a, a snapshot of uh, some of our, our, our many efforts um, you know, leading, we our, our faculty and staff and students have been involved in, in leading efforts and collaborating with other experts across the University of Michigan to provide guidance for the campus and uh, how to return, um, things that, measures that can be taken to uh, include safety precautions for, for campus. We've been operating at a state, uh, statewide level both with business leaders and, and also state government. And I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, and and we've, we've also had significant global contributions, some of those uh, impacting the private sector globally, uh, some actually having even an impact on, on policy and decision making uh, uh, of, of uh, governments internationally. So to go into a bit more detail about a few of the school efforts uh, in, in March, uh, and this was early March, uh, an interdisciplinary group of faculty from the School of Public Health began working uh, closely with public health officials and policymakers to provide modeling and public health expertise to help state leaders such as Governor Whitmer make informed decisions about prevention and response. And so the way this you know, translated early on is, you know, what to do in light of a, a rapidly accelerating um, spread of the pandemic. And then on the, on the other side, how to, re how to begin relaxing uh, some of the, uh, some of the restrictions put in place just in terms of the, uh, the stay home, stay safe or executive order that was put in place. And so to be able to uh, to do so in a safe, but also a timely manner uh, was of the utmost important at that time. And we still, we still continue to work with the, with the state um, on a weekly basis. We uh, actually stood up uh, together with other U University of Michigan collaborators, um, Michigan Safe Start Map dashboard and I encourage you to take a look at it. It's, it's mystartmap.org with my uh, MI as in Michigan. Uh, that uh, pr provides a depiction of data. And the main goal of the dashboard is just to understand the disease risk across the state 
uh, and on a regional basis so that different geographic regions can make decisions about safely reopening schools, businesses, and other aspects of the economy uh, based on their own set of, of, of indicators. And these indicators continue to provide valuable information uh, about the, the virus to help evaluate and uh, inform prevention strategies. Uh, next slide. At the University of Michigan, we also utilized uh, some of this, some similar guidance and input just to help determine how to approach the fall semester. And very early on, I had the privilege of chairing a committee of public health and Michigan medicine faculty who are charged with providing recommendations on how to conduct a, a public health informed in-person fall semester. The, this work was complemented by numerous committees and efforts convened by Provost Collins, President Schlissel uh, to, to round out the university's approach. Uh, and then on the back end of that effort, a number of additional uh, efforts that, that, that continue that focus on details of implementation and, and, and other things. And so what do we mean when we say public health informed? It's really uh, about three things. It's about preparedness, prevention, and then precise and timely response. And uh, a public health informed strategy emphasizes using evidence-based decision making and implementing the necessary risk mitigation strategies to help keep our, our community uh, protected. Uh, this is, um, you know, there's no foolproof uh, method that uh, gets us to zero risk in the face of a, of a pandemic. It's an ongoing and iterative process that will continue until we have a clinically effective vaccine that's uh, proven to be safe and effective and uh, widely produced and, 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 and administered. Uh, next slide. In order uh, in order to prepare for and prevent the spread of COVID, there are many modifications that were made uh, and that can uh, continue to be made across campus. And we call these in public health stacked practices for risk mitigation by utilizing many different risk mitigation strategies at once, we ensure that we're not relying on a single strategy to help keep us safe and, and, and thus increase protection. Uh, oftentimes there are things that are top of mind for some as you know the the single measure that that helps keep us safe but in in, in reality it's uh, the, you know there's no uh, single infallible approach but but, but rather uh, a collection of, of approaches that together can help to substantially reduce risk um, the uh, the school is helping in a couple of very important dimensions or elements of, of uh, the university's approach. One, uh, the, the testing approach by uh, the university has a, a few different dimensions. One of the dimensions is surveillance testing. And currently, a faculty member in the School of Public Health is leading a, a free opt-in surveillance testing program that currently test uh, 3,000 uh, students, faculty, and staff on campus uh, each week. And these tests to use a, a, a PCR, a nasal swab, uh, a PCR type test, and uh, leverages our, our capacity locally here at, at Michigan Medicine. And, and surveillance testing is a really important uh, tool in, in, in public health and it's used in influenza and other things and, and the purpose of surveillance testing deviates from maybe other uh, purposes of, of, of testing but it's an important element to have as a, as a part of our overall framework. Beginning this week we're poised to, to add an additional 3,000 uh, saliva based test uh, that will aid the, the, the surveillance testing and in the coming weeks have the um, potential to even increase capacity substantially higher. Another thing that I'll point to that colleagues in the, in the School of Public Health have worked with uh, uh, not only people around the university, but also the appropriate external stakeholders like the county health departments is a, a contact tracing core. Uh, and in that uh, requires not only to get uh, to, to build a system that's uh, up and running and operational, 
uh, but that also has the capacity for surge in case we see activity or spikes that would have to be able to have that that capacity on standby ready to uh, ready to, to deploy uh, when necessary. Uh, next slide. An area where the university has exceptional strength is uh, just generally speaking is is in research and we're leveraging the strength to better understand uh, the spread of COVID. I'd like to briefly share just a, uh, one example of uh, an effort supported centrally by by the provost office a team of environmental health scientists. Uh, within the school have launched a project uh, that looks at the role of environmental transmission of, of the virus. And while a few studies have monitored the virus on surfaces in hospital rooms, um, you know, the spread via contamination of public spaces or elsewhere within the community uh, is not fully understood. And so the study will look at uh, samples from sewage, air, other surfaces and buildings and, and, and also buses and uh, it, it, it stands to contribute to our understanding of, of risk for, for transmission in a university setting. And so this is just one of a number of examples of uh, the kind of research that, that, that we have taking place here at the university. Uh, and so in closing, you know, I'd like to say, I'd like to just acknowledge if, if, if one thing I think the pandemic has really uh, shined a light nationally on the need to focus attention on developing uh, strong, sound, robust uh, public health infrastructure. And uh, at, the, at the university, I think we can contribute to that in a number of ways. And, and this means training more future public health leaders. And that's through a lot of our normal channels um, and um, uh, traditional students, but, but also when you take a look nationally, even people working on the front lines of public health uh, require continued uh, workforce development. And so additional training is one, and then funding innovative research. I've given examples, but that's one of a number of things that's going on around the university, uh, much less in, in, in the school. Uh, and then, you know, we must uh, respond quickly and effectively to the current crisis by using evidence-based real-time interventions. And so the, the interplay between uh, the work that we have going on, translating that to help guide decisions on campus and at a state, I think really under underscores uh, this need. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude and be happy to, to take any questions. Great, thank you, Du Bois. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, the panel portion of the uh, series tonight. So I'm going to start with you, Susan, if that's okay. So uh, how has the first month been back on campus and what lessons have we learned? And can you talk about some of the modifications that we have made since reactivating campus? That'd be great. Sure, sure. I'm happy to. Um, so uh, it's not a usual semester. That's, that's really clear. I, I said that earlier. Um, on campus in our classroom buildings, we, um, our estimates are that overall we're at about 40% density in terms of uh, what's happening in the buildings. That means things are a lot quieter. Um, and so uh, th that really has a different feel kind of across campus. We have tents across campus and so uh, we're trying to make sure that there are um, places where students can distance. We have some classes that are actually meeting outside um, because that, you know, uh, provides more space and, and is more engaging. Um, so, uh, you know, with a number of our classes being held remotely, um, there are fewer people on campus. Uh, and so that really does feel quite different. Um, students are still quite engaged and we've been working hard to find additional ways to really connect with people, especially um, given the distancing and the various kinds of interventions and risk mitigations that um, that you just heard about. Uh, and some, some of that is through virtual communities, which um, we both are launching among our faculty and our staff. Uh, student life is very engaged in doing that in a variety of ways. And many of our students have launched um, virtual communities as well. And some of those actually are connecting students who are on campus with students who are um, studying remotely. And so that helps to bring them in and make some of those connections as well. 
Um, a lot more things I could talk about there, but let me talk about some of the modifications. Um, one is we had to do a whole revamp of our bus system, right? I mean, we have North Campus, we have Central Campus, we have the Medical Campus, and the bus, buses tended to be packed and crowded during peak load times. And we didn't really think what made sense there because we had to find provide ways to transport people, but we wanted to do that in a way that was safe. And so there was a lot of work over the summer to um, experiment with various ways of refitting the buses, figuring out also how to change the bus routes so no one with more of a hub and spoke model so that no one would be on the bus for longer than 15 minutes, for example. What kind of density made sense? What was the airflow in terms of which windows should be open or not and where we might have plexiglass? So how we do our buses is certainly one area that we've had quite a lot of, of modification. I would also say a continued work in progress is learning how to use technology when you're teaching a hybrid class. So you have some students in person and some students who are joining in remotely. Um, and we provided a lot of best practice and suggestions in um, our Center for Academic Innovation. But in fact, what's happening across campus is that we're learning by doing. And I see this as one of the pieces of lemonade or the kind of pictures of lemonade here out of the, the, some of the lemons we're grappling with because we're finding all kinds of really exciting ways that we can improve teaching and learning that are gonna be with us for a long time. And that's actually one of the, the things that we're focused both on how to make things more robust now, but also looking forward to think about what things we might wanna learn from. And our faculty have just been fabulous partners in that and our students have great expertise as well. So um, those are those are a couple of the things that that I mentioned, but you know there's a lot of learning going on. This is continuous improvement. Susan, thanks so much. Du Bois, a couple questions for you. Can you share with us about the prevention and preparedness efforts that have taken place on campus? Susan touched on it a little bit. From your perspective, though, um, how have these efforts changed and evolved evolved over time as the situation has changed? to propel the U of M response to the global health challenge. Can you give us some of your thoughts on that? Sure, I'd be happy to. And, um, you know, Provost Collins alluded to a couple of, of things, as you mentioned, and, you know, you can, uh, for the audience, you can imagine uh, an institution at the scale of, of the University of Michigan um, in a relatively short period identifying what the measures should be getting them up and running and tested and, and ensuring uh, coordination is, is no small feat. And, and so I will name a couple of buckets of things that were involved in, in the university's efforts uh, and then you know, try to allude a little bit to um, you know, uh, uh, the, quest, the part of the question about the evolution of, of those. And so uh, certainly a part of the university's uh, preparations involved uh, testing. And I, I talked specifically about a, an element of testing that uh, colleagues here in the School of Public Health are uh, involved in, but in addition to the surveillance testing, um, you know, there was there was entry testing and, and symptomatic testing uh, for individuals in, in, in context. And so that is something that, um, you know, was a part of the plan, continues to evolve in that when many of the plans were made, uh, the, the state of the art for testing uh, was entirely different. And so um, as uh, more testing becomes available, uh, and accessible, then you know that will be factored into to, to the university's framework. Containment strategies, so uh, case tracking, uh, contact tracing, uh, quarantine, isolation, uh, a whole set of measures that are important from a public health uh, perspective to try to contain any cases that that emerge on campus. And so there, there's a system there uh, that was put in place that we continue to learn more about and refine. Some of this is, is learn more about and refine from a public health perspective, but importantly, it, it's also from a, um, a community member experience perspective and, you know, some lessons learned there. And I think that, that we continue to make uh, improvements each week there. Uh, monitoring, there are a set of digital tools that are uh, developed that had to be developed from scratch. And, you know, we, we sort of put our heads together as, as uh, faculty, 
at the university in partnership with individuals from uh, the, the College of Engineering, School of Information, uh, to in, in um, uh, our, our ITS uh, a group here uh, who oversees te the technology at the university. And, and so uh, very, you know, I think proud of what we've been able to pull together and, and stand up that will both serve a couple of purposes. It'll help to inform uh, future decisions and efforts at the university, but it also serves as a level of transparency to, to keep members of the community aware. And I, and I feel like that's also an important part of our efforts. Um, the, there are a number of things along the lines of communications, of, you know, in, in, in terms of education and health behavior efforts that have been pursued by student life and other, other uh, um, groups on, on campus. And, and then in terms of the stacked practices, it, engineering controls of plexiglass and configuring spaces, uh, Provost Collins made adjustments to the to the calendar and we, we refer to those as administrative controls uh, to try to come up with a strategy again to, to mitigate risk, uh, personal controls, things like wearing masks. So a, a, a whole suite of, um, of, of efforts, activities that that really factor into the university's approach. How, we, how some of those things have changed in, in addition to what I've mentioned, you know, we continue to work at integration. Um, these things are not things that a university has sole control over. Again, we have to coordinate with the county health department, with the state health department, and timing is important. And so how to get data uh, in a fluid way as quickly as possible. Um, you know, those are things that we've, we've been working on and having groups uh, ready to, uh, uh, to really monitor those data in real time so that we're poised uh, to, to, to respond. And then uh, the, the last thing I'll, I'll say in response to the question is thinking also about our, uh, about our response. M most of you are aware last academic year uh, in March, the university pivot from, pivoted from in-person to remote uh, in, on, on very short notice. Ideally, you'd want a number of interventions. You don't you want a binary situation of either we're on campus uh, or we're remote, but 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 really fleshing out a suite of interventions that that are more precise, more timely, uh, to so that the the university um, has flexibility to to be able to determine the appropriate measures to take in in light of emerging data. Boys, thanks. I'm going to ask you one more question, then I have a question for Susan. Then we're going to go to the chat. So, uh, Du Bois, long before the coronavirus pandemic was part of our everyday lives. Uh, disease prevention and preparedness was a central issue within the field of public health. So my question is, how has public health research, both past and present, helped to support response efforts across the state and on campuses as well? Yeah, so, um, you know, we have a rich history here at the School of Public Health um, in the area of vaccinations and uh, polio and other 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 things, specifically addressing your question, um, we have a faculty member who's still an active faculty member in the School of Public Health who developed the concept of herd immunity, uh, and uh, uh, the faculty member Arno Monto still has an active uh, research program, and together with uh, colleagues. Uh, who are involved in the university's re re response efforts, you know, we pull from that, that, that background, that history, that knowledge, that activity to help inform our, our, our efforts. Um, one of the, 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 the colleagues, Dr. Emily Martin, um, is, runs an effort at a state level on behalf of a national uh, system funded by the Centers for Disease Control to monitor influenza. And this is longstanding work. And, and it's really, um, you know, on the heels of, of, of these efforts that we can formulate plans for a novel virus. And, and so we're not just making up things on the fly, um, but they're, they're based on uh, lessons learned with other uh, infectious diseases or viruses, uh, in some cases, respiratory illnesses. And so, so the, it, it's, you know, we're privileged to have uh, that, that, that history serve as a foundation to help inform us. And, and uh, I think we're learning, you know, that, uh, that um, masks and social distancing continue to be our most effective tools for containing uh, the spread. 
of the virus and and also uh, as alluded to in my previous response that policymakers and you know decision makers at the university need real time data to respond quickly and so um, I think you know continuing to develop and refine the, the the information the system on the hills of a uh, of, of a history that that helps to inform us, uh, but refining it uh, as as necessary to address a novel virus. Thank you. So, Susan, we know that the pandemic has hit many areas of the economy hard. You're an economist, so you're perfectly positioned to answer this question. What uncertainty are we facing at the University of Michigan? And could you also give us some examples of the increased costs that we're facing across campus? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And let, let me just start with a sentence from the economic standpoint. I mean, it's a really unusual recession. It's very different from the kinds of recessions that we've been used to in terms of its impact, um, because uh, you know you can't really reopen um, until you address the, the kind of health issues as well. And so the uncertainty that is raised is um, kind of a different nature and in some ways, I think, more extensive. Um, than some of the other uh, deep recessions that we've grappled with that come from financial crises or things like that. In terms of the university, um, our university, like other higher ed institutions, all of our resource uh, re uh, revenue sources were impacted. Um, at, you know, every single one. So uh, uncertainty about enrollments for a variety of different reasons, especially international enrollments, and I can say more about that. Uncertainty about the um, state support uncertainty about research funding, uncertainty, you know, about every single uh, revenue source, um, and also uncertainty in terms of our costs, because uh, the, the kind of um, ways of addressing things that we've been talking about um, are costly in, in ways that we kind of had to figure out. And I'll come back and say a bit more about that. We have had some kind of reassuring news in the short run. So we've learned recently that um, our budget that we passed in June that had kind of estimates or predictions for core parts of our budget um, that, that actually are quite on target. So in particular, we learned recently that the um, state appropriation for higher education will be flat relative to last year. That's actually what we had budgeted for. And so that is a, a relief in that sense. Um, the expectation is for fiscal year 22, uh, we are likely to take much more of a hit. And so there's still uncertainty there, but in the near term that that's actually quite helpful. Um, our enrollments, we predicted that enrollments would see a modest decline. And in fact, that's what the data are showing. We don't have the final numbers for our fall enrollments, but it looks as if our undergraduate enrollments are um, flat or up a bit. Um, our graduate enrollments, as we had anticipated, are down, especially among international students. And, and so that translates together into a modest decline, which again, puts us right on target for the budget because that's what we had been predicting when we tried to estimate things uh, further back. So in the near term, um, those with all of the cost containment things that we've done, um, our, our budget's actually in a, quite a stable place, which is reassuring, but there's a lot of uncertainty still going forward, and I could say more about that. Um, you also asked about some of the extra costs that we're uh, grappling with, and, and so um, we have, uh, we're facing more than $60 million related to extra costs associated with COVID. Some of the key ones have to do with all the testing that you just heard about and some of the contact tracing. There's also costs of custodial services, which is really uh, very important and the cleaning supplies and, and how we uh, kind of manage that to uh, address sanitation kinds of issues. We had to, you know, refit a number of our classrooms to deal with distancing and to uh, do some of those kinds of controls that, that you were hearing about before. Um, we have, uh, you know, the tents to try to help with distancing to make sure that we have spaces for, for students. So those are some of the costs. I also wanted to, uh, and actually a big one there that I should mention that we've actually been really pleased has worked quite well is that we mounted a pretty large laptop loaner program. And instead of uh, expecting people to come in and collect those laptops, and it's for students especially, but also faculty and staff who might need that to be able to connect in the, you know, the, the world that we're living in, is it, it's a kind of sites at home. And so we uh, made sure that we addressed where people would be and loaned the laptops out that way. 
we also were anticipating, given the economic situation, that our financial aid needs were going to go up substantially. And so we've allocated a, um, you know, kind of significantly increased amount to support our students uh, to make sure that they are able to continue their studies if circumstances change for them and so that we're prepared to handle that. So, you know, that's just kind of a high level for some of the things, Tom, but a uh, really important issue that we continue to monitor. Great, thank you both, uh, very much for the detail that you provided. Um, so we have a number of questions from our, our guests tonight and they basically fall into the three main categories as I look at them today, the student experience, uh, some additional questions on testing, and some questions about the Greek system and the freshman experience. So I'm gonna move through these. Um, and Susan, why don't I start with you? There's a set of questions around uh, asking if you can talk more about the student experience relative to finding places to study. I know it's getting colder outside. Um, one person reflects here that their daughter's back in Michigan and she craves spaces to work in that's beyond her dorm room. Um, so can you talk about that a little bit and, you know, how are students uh, meeting each other and getting to know each other during, the, you know, this just unique experience that students are having? Yeah, that's a really important question and it's something that we continue to learn more about and find new ways to try to support. So, um, for example, we've been surprised that the library space, we were worried that because we had to de-densify, uh, and I think we've done that in a very thoughtful way, we were surprised that in fact our library spaces are actually underused even at the de-densified level. And so there are places across campus that we've refitted um, to provide um, places students can go that aren't just staying in their room because there's a limit to how long you can just stay in your room. Um, and uh, we need to continue to get the word out that those spaces are, uh, are not full um, and they're inside because clearly as it gets colder, the tents and some of those solutions are not going to be as helpful. Um, and so we continue to be exploring ways that we can do that uh, better. In terms of the student experience, the provost office has been kind of working increasingly with the student life team who are particularly engaged with a variety of ways to reach out to students, to help make connections, to find ways, some of that's virtually, but some of it's in person as well. Um, and they've been exploring a variety of kinds of things and reaching back out to the students to find out what do they find helpful, right? I mean, not making assumptions there. In fact, we're about to do um, a new set of surveys of our students to find out what they're experiencing. Again, you know, I think sometimes stop, start, still helps. What should we stop doing that's not working so well? What do we need to start or do more of? And what are the things that they actually think, yeah, this is great, don't stop doing this. So we're trying to work with our students. Um, each of the schools and colleges also has kind of a pretty robust set of things that they're doing within their contexts. Um, and, uh, and then we're trying to complement that centrally. But this is a very new environment and we're still learning. So we're, you know, I, I would say that we continue to be very focused on what more we can do to make sure, especially our freshmen who don't already have strong connections across campus um, are able to do that. I would also say some of our students who are joining remotely, especially our freshmen joining remotely, that's particularly difficult because um, they don't, you know, uh, it's harder to connect them in. And so we're looking for additional ways to do that and um, we'll continue to report back examples, share best practice across our schools and colleges and expand our programming. So Susan, one question that emerged was how can we encourage uh, professors to allow more socialization within class, especially as you mentioned for freshman students. Any thoughts on that? So I think that's a great question. And that's actually one of the things that um, some of our kind of best practice communities have been reaching out with. So um, especially if you have a class that's partly in person and partly remote, how you engage those students is different from what you would do just in a standard in-person class, which we're all used to. Um, and so sharing out those best practices with our faculty is absolutely something that we will continue to do. At the scale of Michigan, it takes a while to kind of get some of those ideas out there. Um, but enlisting our students' help and their ideas for what they think is effective has also been great. And then we try to share those around. I mean, teaching a discussion section in 
an English literature class is quite different from some of the things that might come up in a class in the sciences or you know, a large lecture class where you're trying to engage people in smaller groups. So there's a variety of different contexts that we are trying to keep in mind too in terms of what interventions might be the most helpful. Great, thank you. So a lot of questions, as I mentioned about testing, I know we've talked about a little bit. I'm gonna throw this out. Maybe uh, Du Bois, you can help us get started. There's <laughs> about mandatory testing versus opt-in, surveillance testing, all these different terms, our strategy vis-a-vis -vis other universities. You know, we hear University of Illinois is testing every student multiple times a week. And I know that your teams and the president and Susan, you as well have had conversations with colleagues across the country. Can you talk a little bit about Michigan's approach? Um, people are very curious about um, what, is, what is kind of the science behind their approach and how we came upon the kind of the Michigan way of um, handling testing protocols in general. So I'll say I'll say a few I'll say a few words, um, and and you know where where I end will be that things are still evolving rapidly, uh, and my uh, you know my comments earlier suggested that uh, you know when you think about the scale at the University of Michigan, if you want to be able to come through in a reliable way. Um, that it, um, things are things are challenging, and when we began planning, as a as a, a the, the committee that I had the privilege of chairing, um, you know, tests were were uh, not widely available, uh, tests were inaccurate, <laughs> uh, and the landscape was was uh, very very questionable, and and so and serology uh, was. There was much more optimism about the role of serology, and so it, it just in a in a few short months, um, the landscape has changed dramatically, and and so what we what we did was basically we tried to establish um, some of the building blocks again that are uh, are are essential for an overall testing approach, with each one being able to uh, to to be bolstered. As, as we move forward. And so the, as, as mentioned earlier, the entry testing uh, is one component, um, uh, the surveillance testing, another component, and then a, a critical piece obviously is to be able to, uh, to test anyone with symptoms. Uh, I think there's room for us to increase as, as a university and I think we'll benefit from doing so. Um, and I'm excited that, you know, we have prospects that on the, you know, already some things that are just launching this week, prospects on the horizon to, to increase that a bit more. Um, but but I, I will say, I don't, um, I don't think that testing is a panacea. So as we look at other universities that have had um, you know, I guess two, two issues that I'll point to, and this is not finger pointing in any way, but some universities who went out early uh, declaring to do uh, uh, significant testing at scale and weren't able to follow through for some of the limitations that I, that I mentioned earlier. And then other universities that have done an admirable job of getting their testing up and running at scale um, and being able to test every, you know, members of the community multiple times per week. Um, you know, still ended up in situations that were concerning for for the university and where the chancellor had to make decisions to uh, effectively uh, ask people to modify activities over a couple of week period. And so, I, you know, those comments are just to say that, that, that things are evolving, they're complicated for the university. Uh, I think we uh, uh, have started in a way that gives us room for improvement and we're headed, we're headed there and I, and I feel uh, encouraged by the directions that, that, that we're taking. Thank you. Can you, Susan or uh, Du Bois, there's a question about how does the quarantine process work, you know, if a student is found to be symptomatic uh, or uh, asymptomatic and has COVID. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the, COVID, uh, about how the quarantine uh, process works? Do you want to take that, Susan? So I'll take a piece of it, and then maybe you can fill in uh, okay. some of the sure. some of the others. Um, and so the university did put aside 600 rooms um, that would be spaces for quarantine or isolation uh, students. And um, the you know, and I, and I the goal here is to make sure because if a student is in one of those spaces for a, a two week period. Um, you know, that, that could be scary, it could feel lonely, and so the intent is to have those students be really supported to make sure that they're 
um, you know, there's a hotline, there's a place that they can call if they have any needs, if their uh, dining needs are taken care of, et cetera. Um, and so basically the way that it works is that once a student is identified who has either been in contact through this contact tracing um, process that uh, was described earlier, um, or has actually tested positive and doesn't have a place to safely quarantine or isolate in their own uh, living situation. I mean, student might be able to, to do that um, in their own situation if they have their own room and they have good access to a bathroom. But if not, the idea was to make sure that we had safe places um, for that quarantine or isolation to take place and to do what we can to make sure that the students are well supported uh, during that time period. What did I what did I leave out? What, so what so I think you, I, I think you 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 covered it and and you know I would just comment in in terms of the university's approach. Part of the things that we monitor very very closely uh, involve capacity and um, it, you know we one of the things related to the question is we monitor capacity of quarantine space and so so far um, there has been activity on campus as as one would expect. Uh, but it, but it's all been um, in, in, certainly at manageable levels in terms of our capacity, um, and we will continue to monitor. There, you know, I, 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 at no point I think in this semester or next semester I, will we ever be kind of in the clear. This is a um, there, there's always that need for vigilance, uh, but but in terms of the capacity that, that that we're doing very well in that regard of, of of having more than adequate capacity relative to the things that have have a, um, uh, arisen. Great, thank you, Susan. This one might be for you. Um, talking about off-campus behavior, testing the sororities and fraternities. How do we um, how do we monitor and handle um, behavior or just, you know, student um, activities that are beyond the dorms? So really important question and something that we've thought a lot about and is also a work in progress. Let me say a few things about that. Starting uh, months and months ago, we reach out to all of the different congregate living uh, circumstances, uh, conditions that um, our Greek life and, and other as well for a variety of reasons. One is we wanted to develop relationships. We wanted to work together on an understanding of what kind of safe practices and behaviors were um, and to engage students in helping us develop the way that we were going to message across campus and the way that we were gonna partner with our students so that this would be something that we would work on together. Um, and we also wanted to, because you know, part of uh, in typical times, uh, students like to gather together and they like to engage in parties and a variety of other kinds of social behavior. But of course, the traditional approach is really not safe behavior in the current context. A way to connect with fraternities um, or sororities or places if information that there might be things happening that we were concerned about to have ways to kind of collectively address that. So making sure that for many that there, you know, who would be a good person to contact that, um, that living, uh, that living group to address if there were, you know, many people congregated or, or other kinds of contexts like that. So the approach has been to work together um, and I think for the most part, it's actually worked quite well. That doesn't mean that there aren't uh, circumstances and, and challenges that we're, we're still kind of grappling with in terms of, you know, um, navigating how different this, <laughs> this context is for being a student from typical contexts. So, um, so those are a couple of the, the, the things that I would mention. I mean, one issue that has arisen um, that has gotten quite a bit of discussion is that there are some students who do decide that a test would be valuable and helpful for them who get that test off campus. So we've been trying to make sure that it's well known that we partner really closely with the county. Uh, and so if students receive tests off campus, that's still part of uh, the information that the university is well aware of. And so it's still part of the um, information we are reviewing that we are um, adjusting to that we are following up on in terms of uh, what safe behaviors might look like. So, so I guess those are some responses, but that's an important question and um, 
uh, you know, one that uh, we'll, we'll continue asking and seeing whether there's more things we can do. I'm going to also ask my colleague, Dean Bowman, are there any other things you would add in terms of, of that set of issues? It's kind of a robust <laughs> set yeah. of uh, things in that question. I think you covered it very well. I, I you know, I can't think of any, uh, you know, sort of any additional things that come to mind uh, to complete, to round out your answer. So, so Du Bois, this is a quick one, and maybe it came up as you've worked and provided advice to uh, Michigan, state of Michigan leaders. Uh, the question is, how does uh, Michigan's COVID rate compare with, um, how does Michigan compare with other states and other, and within Michigan, how is the University of Michigan's experience uh, related to other Michigan universities? Any comments on that? Yeah, so, you know, nationally, what I would say is, you know, the state of Michigan has done reasonably well, um, you know, reasonable, reasonably well uh, in light of a pandemic is, is nothing to celebrate. Uh, there's always reason for concern in, in, a, in a continued way and, and vigilance, I think. Um, we were able to recover from an early uh, spike uh, back in in March to relatively low levels. Uh, since that time, uh, as things opened up in the state, uh, levels levels have 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 risen and, and sort of uh, stayed at a higher plateau. Uh, that is a, um, also similar to what we've seen in Washtenaw County that we've done relatively well. Um, uh, by way of, by, by way of analog relatively well in, in Washtenaw County compared to other counties in Michigan um, but there's been you know uh, recent changes in in the the county level data so again a need to to remain vi uh, vigilant in terms of other universities um, it's hard to know the right uh, comparisons you know the the academic institutions within the state are very different in many respects uh, there are there are some, and, and, and again, not necessarily trying to point fingers, but there are some that have fared far worse than the University of Michigan, um, and what they've experienced early on, and um, you know, and, and, and those I, I think reflect the actions at the University of Michigan, um, uh, what, what the university has taken, and the continued efforts at, at monitoring. But but again, there's no victory here. Uh, but but so far so good uh, with the with the entry transition and now uh, during this uh, part of the, the the fall semester as we approach the winter months uh, need to to continue to devote attention and monitor the, the data that we have uh, and respond very very quickly and, and and precisely as alluded to earlier. Thank you, Du Bois, and thank you, Susan, for just really a really engaging conversation tonight. Every time I spend time with you, I learn more and more. And I really appreciate all the questions that our ha guests had tonight for us to eliminate and create more understanding in terms of where we are and how we're moving forward. So I just really want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. I hope that you learned uh, a number of things as well. As I said, I know that I did. It's a really a complex environment and I am so grateful to you for your interest and uh, your willingness to engage with us tonight. We'd all be delighted, all of us here will be delighted at Michigan to talk more about the questions and some of the issues that were raised tonight. If anyone's interested in some of our fundraising efforts around supporting the university with student access and some of the other things that we are doing to, um, to make Michigan a safe place, uh, also to provide the latest technology in terms of enhanced remote learning. So we're happy to talk to you about that. But most importantly, I wanna thank you for joining us tonight. We, I want you to stay healthy, stay safe, and go blue. Thank you very much.